everybody. It's kind of a treat to be able to wind things down here and, and be in front of you. And uh, I just want to tell you a success story that came out of uh, the Southern California Marine Mammal Workshop. So I've been involved with the process since day one. Um, and I'm going to tell you the story of CDOC and the SCMMW. You can tell I read a lot of children's books. Um, say a, a five-year-old and an eight-year-old, and, and uh, the title reflects the title of most of those books. Do I have a way to advance the slide? Um, I should say also that I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank the Pacific Life Foundation, in particular Bob back there, Tennyson, I think is over there by the coffee having a brownie, um, Sarah, of course, for organizing all of us, and there is one unsung hero who I think always tries to keep a relatively still profile here, but it's John Hildebrand right there. He is absolutely instrumental in helping this workshop uh, happen every year. So thanks to all of you guys. I really appreciate that. And I'd also like to thank Francis and Randy for their excellent keynote addresses. Uh, in 2010, the first workshop we had, uh, Jay Barlow asked me to give a talk on gray whales and California coastal bottlenose dolphins, and I called them the icons of the California coast. I think they really are. And one thing, One uh, thing that I really focused on was the California coastal bottlenose dolphin population. And part of that focus was to tell you that we've got 30 years of data on the animals. Behavioral data, photo ID data, extends all the way back to 1984 and in some cases back to 1981. And I told you the story about how those dolphins move up and down the coast. They've got this amazing skinny but long uh, range all the way from Ensenada in Baja up to uh, Monterey Bay and now on occasion up to San Francisco Bay. The following year, in 2011, I was asked to lead a panel on research collaboration and data sharing. And my main theme there was just like these ants is that together we can do something that we can't do alone. And I focused on the term collaboration or to collaborate. And I pointed out that I particularly like the term conspire. <laughs> Here, I also focused on California bottlenose dolphins, and I came with my own agenda, is to pitch the idea of trying to form a collaboration amongst researchers in California and Baja to form an integrated database. Um, Priority X came from my son. I was working on this just the night before the workshop, and I said, you know, Henry, what should I call this? Priority, he said X, and I said, Why do you say that? He said, Because it's cool. And that was it. He took off, and so it became Priority X, which we focused a great amount of uh, discussion and attention on in, in the workshop last year. And I showed you where the data sources actually live, and that they are uh, similar, but they're disjunct. There was no true coordination as of yet to put them all together in a centralized form. And we had data up in Monterey Bay. Any of those circles are where a, a, a vast amount of, of information um, is held by different researchers. So after uh, two days of discussion and kind of focusing on this as one of, one of the items of that workshop, uh, in the 2011 report from, from our workshop here, a call for action was made, and that said a shared database and photo catalog for California bottlenose dolphins should be uh, achieved if possible. So I'm glad to tell you that we've actually done that. <clears throat> it's a tangible product that's come out of two years of workshops, and here we are at the third, and we can actually tell you something about it. CDOC stands for the California Dolphin Online Catalog. Here's the many collaborators so far. Uh, I think that's 14 or 15 people there. A variety of different institutions. Here's what a screenshot looks like. I should tell you that this catalog is an OBIS CMAP. Um, phase one, it's an online prototype, exists now. It's populated by about 10 years of data that were shared by a number of the researchers in the area. And it's ready for testing. In fact, that's the next thing on our agenda as, as phase one was to build the prototype and now start to work with it and tinker with it. Um, for phase two, the focus Phase two is a hypothetical phase two. Um, but in the future, what we want to do is to try and um, refine the application, customize it to our own 
views, and then get all interested data holders to contribute their data into the system. Um, I should tell you that some of the negotiations on this took place here in this building, in these rooms, and I'm very thankful for Pacific's Life, in Pacific Life Foundation's encouragement and support. Um, I'd also like to thank our uh, uh, appreciation to all of the collaborators that have contributed data or potentially will contribute data in the future. Um, Duke University has been absolutely fantastic in helping us to adopt their existing system, put our data into that system, and then also willing to help us customize it. So thanks a lot to everybody. Bob, thank you very much. And uh, there's a, the California Coastal Online Catalog. Dave, but I'll try. I also want to echo uh, Dave's thanks to everybody in the room, actually, and, and the steering committee for making these workshops possible. Before I start, I do want to apologize to the many people who have been working diligently on this issue of vessel strikes, um, because this presentation will not do your efforts or motivation justice. Um, I'm sure everybody in the room who's working on it and all the rest of you whose ears are buzzing out there in cyberspace will appreciate that. Last year, uh, in 2011, uh, I co-led a workshop with Jessica Redfern from the Southwest Fisheries Science Center uh, entitled Vessel Strike Reduction in Southern California. The right side. The right side. <laughs> Um, so this is a bad background that we had when we started. Uh, collisions with vessels are a threat to a number of marine vertebrate species worldwide, particularly large whales. This is not anything new to anyone in this room. Virtually any motorized vessel type, size, or, age, or class are represented in these records. Um, and the number of deaths documented in the literature are minimum. Shipping traffic has increased along the west coast of North America over the past decade and Los Angeles and Long Beach and San Francisco ports are some of the busiest in the U.S. And again, a substantial number of the vessel collisions with whales go undetected or unreported. <clears throat> Here's an update on what we had last year regarding the number of uh, whale vessel strikes in California by species from 1988 to 2011. Uh, call your attention that gray whales are the ones that are struck the most that are identified, but we have a large block of unidentified animals as well, and uh, that's not that they're a new species that we haven't identified yet, it's just that they're not identified to species. So pretty much every species has been documented as hit. Okay, this is just a graph just to show you where these reports have come in. It's no surprise when you look at a map of California that they are coincidental to where there's large areas of humans also, but it's probably a little bit of both that that's where there are areas being hit and also where we're having lots of reports and in the areas where we have these large ports also. So the panel discussed two management strategies, speed and location. Um, speed, I think, is pretty intuitive, either it's fast or slow. Um, but the other part, the location, was looking at risk and risk being proportional to the overlap between the whales and the vessel traffic. And that's just a little um, elementary way to sort of uh, show how that is, where you've got high areas of co-occurrence, you would have a higher risk versus low areas of co-occurrence. And the panel discussed this at length. And we concluded that there wasn't an easy solution. The science may confound our options. There were models showing opposing hotspots for different species. We were limited by data. Sightings were rare and opportunistic. The fate of the animals was unknown. Details of the interactions usually aren't provided. The existing ship strike regulation on the East Coast may have limited applicability here as it was done for a different whale species in a different ocean and with different traffic areas. <clears throat> but that didn't deter us. Despite these challenges, we were committed to continuing to work on this issue with the goal of reaching out to our partners in the scientific community, other agencies in the shipping industry also, um, to develop ways to minimize the risk of interactions and the severity of these interactions between ships and large whales off the coast of California. And we wouldn't have been able to do that if we hadn't had the opportunity to get together here last year in the same room and have these people all sitting at the same table and talking to one another. Apparently, I'm right challenged. So one thing that came up was this <coughs> post access route study that the US Coast Guard was conducting before we had our meeting, and, it's con and it's, since 
had a little bit of an evolution since the meeting, so I want to update you on that very quickly. Um, right here I have an example of LA Long Beach. There was also one in San Francisco as well. And this is actually a direct reflection, what, what I'm showing here on this map, and I'll explain in a second, is a direct reflection of contributions from people in this room and from researchers and stakeholders and management folks getting together and providing recommendations to the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, the U.S. Coast Guard conducts this, conducted this study, uh, uh, potential traffic density and safe access routes for vessels uh, proceeding to and from the ports. And what happened was efforts by California to better regulate air pollution from the shipping industry unexpectedly shifted vessel traffic outside of the designated travel shipping lane, which is that thick line there that you see up at the, in, the, in the middle of the map. The U.S. Coast Guard was re-examining the regulations of shipping traffic into the Los Angeles, Long Beach, and San Francisco. And the primary purpose was to recon reconcile the need for safe access routes within other reasonable waterway uses. But what benefited us is that we were able to comment on this to see if there was an opportunity to reduce whale vessel collision risk. And what happened in September 2011 in LA, Long Beach, a proposal came out that decreased the size of the uh, traffic separation stream from four nautical miles to three nautical miles. And the traffic uh, lanes would be uh, narrowed, which pulled them away from important habitat areas, particularly for blue whales. And they were also think, they're also considering now to create a western approach south of the Channel Islands, uh, and they will be uh, one nautical mile as well. And that will somewhat alleviate some of the pressure that was happening. And that all happened thanks to having the meeting that we had here in 2011. So since the last workshop, several papers have been submitted and are in review. Again, this post, uh, the port access route study has been going on. There's also changes in the CARB again that folks are currently commenting on and, and working through. Joint working <coughs> groups have formed, basically mimicking some of the, the um, folks that we had here last year. Uh, we have efforts underway to involve industry and research. We're expanding modeling efforts to include all data collected at a finer scale. Research targeting specific management strategies is proposed, and we're reaching out to unconventional collaborators for support. So for example, what Leilani was talking about, maybe going to some of these smartphone operators and asking them to donate some of the equipment so that we can use it in some of our research since these are lean times. But we would not have been able to do that without Pacific Life or the Southern California Marine Mammal Workshop. So in just a year, this is all that we've accomplished. So I want to congratulate the community on that. different direction. Um, these have been some great things accomplished. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about me instead of things people have accomplished as a team. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, it's the right side, huh? And notice I titled this a story. It has yet to be seen whether this is a success story. Right. Um, literally a year ago, uh, I was kind of looking for a career shift. Uh, I've been uh, finding myself dead-ended, kind of in where I was going. Uh, I wanted to do something meaningful. I wanted to find some new field to jump into. But I wanted to find a way to network, um, find a way to meet people in some new field. I've done this once before, starting up a small company. Um, and at that point, about a year ago, my girlfriend invites me to tag along with her to this little conference in Southern California. And so I did that. And you know, a little about me, I, I spent my entire adult life as a computer programmer, a uh, professional. I started out in video games, I actually put myself through college writing video games way back in the 80s. I worked for Warehouse doing forestry management software. I founded a little company called Mobile Tech in those GPS marine navigation software back in the 90s. And then the last oh, 12 years or so, I worked at Microsoft as a software engineer, most recently working on camera control systems, which was kind of one of the things that led me to thinking, I need to get out there and do something interesting and, and with meaning and purpose again. Um, I, I was working on you know, setting the flash on a little phone. <laughs> um, showed up at the conference, tagging along, and met a lot of passionate people. You guys are amazing. Um, you care about what you want, to, what you're doing. You, you, you feel a need to contribute something positive. There's an amazing array of networking here. You guys work together like the past two speakers have talked about. Um, and in my case, I started talking to people doing aerial surveys, behavioral studies, the other like land-based surveys, vessel surveys, uh, group of people by an airplane, there was sauna buoys. Um, and that started my thinking process, really kicked me in. Um, I started looking at where I might be able to use my skills to help out to 
started kind of a new, new career. Um, started talking with various people and discovered there was a real need for software for observational scientists to record their observations in real time, uh, especially starting out focusing on aerial surveys where recording software can be a bit of a challenge as sightings, especially off the Southern California coast, come rapid fire over and over. How do you keep up with that with software? Uh, certain people have been just reduced to using paper and Excel spreadsheets because they just can't keep up with it. Um, who's I talking to using DOS-based applications? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, because none of the modern Windows stuff could do it. You just couldn't. So, oh, um, so I wrote some software. I actually said, buy Microsoft. I'm going to do this again. I, I've done this once before with Noble Tech. I decided I'm going to start cranking out software. I did this about in March last year. Um, wanted to create software that was easy, as fast as your DOS program, simple as your DOS program, user configurable. This is one thing I saw was that all the software out there, you, you had to go back to the manufacturer to get new fields added. Now I want the scientists to be able to set their own fields. They can do, you know, we've been using it, line transects, behaviors, the otherwise land, vessel, whatever you want, integrate with the GPS, relocate sightings, which is a big deal for aerial surveys, you know, but it's also important in vessel surveys. So I did that. I, I wrote that. And uh, right now, Mr. C, this is literally, you notice the timestamp on this? It was an hour ago. That's where my software's out there playing. <coughs> Um, we're using it, doing some line transect abundance surveys. Next week, we're integrating aerial and sonoboy behavioral uh, for some behavioral studies. Uh, looks like I'm going to fly up with the airplane. They're actually going to cut a hole in the bottom of the airplane. We're going to get the sonoboy dropping thing. Later this month, um, I've actually donated my software to some grad students working in uh, Puerto Rico to do some field flight studies. Um, and back to that, my goal is that maybe next year I can talk to you about some of the good things we've accomplished and. And, and done like the first two speakers. This time I'm talking about me. Last year, 2011, was one of the triggers that allowed me to, and kind of motivated me to uh, get to hang out with you cool kids. Um, there's a plug there for my software. If you are in the need of it, uh, go check out the website. Love to hear what you have to say, and I'll see you all next year. Thanks a lot. And lastly, we have Elaine, and she's, uh, just, she's a student she's going to talk about her experience here. Um, my collaboration is definitely on a smaller scale, but to me very important. So, my name is Yaren de Jean Martin, I'm a graduate student at California State University in Long Beach, um, and I am working on my master's in biology with an emphasis in marine biology. And so, last year I came here with my first meeting. My friend and colleague Mary Glassix talked to me about it. Um, and so I met a lot of uh, interesting people in the field of marine biology and oceanography. But one person that uh, particularly helped it advance my project was uh, Dr. Judy St. Leder, um, who is the Director of Pathology and Senior Veterinarian at SeaWorld. And um, because my project includes working with California sea lions, um, I need to get the samples from these animals, and in order to do so, I need to work in collaboration with uh, stranding descendants along the California coast. And um, um, and so uh, these centers are very busy, and I rely on their generosity and, and time um, for them to provide me with these samples. And so for me, it's uh, crucial that I work with as many that's crucial. Uh, can you hear me? That battery ran out. Um, <laughs> it's fine. Um, <laughs> 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 Sorry. I don't know if you probably all. Uh, and so it's crucial for me to work with as many stranding centers as possible. And um, so due to this new collaboration I established last year, I was able to get um, half of my samples from, uh, from SeaWorld. And so that definitely helped in advancing my uh, project. Um, also, um, this year I can go even further because I was able to, even though I had already communicated with um, Dr. Gulland, I was able to um, meet with her face to face and um, I guess deepen our relationship because email is quite informal 
Um, so face to face with mice, and I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do so probably if um, it wasn't for being able to come to this uh, marine mammal workshop. And um, so that's it. So I want to thank uh, obviously um, Pacific Life for holding this meeting and helping in organizing, and as well Sarah for inviting me to come up here, even though my project is so small scale. But um, yeah, so working with Dr. Gulland and other Stanton centers is very important. And so thank you very much. Okay, so we'll just have um, Barb Taylor come up and give a brief wrap up, and then we all can go home. <laughs> no pressure there. <laughs> So I know everybody's been thinking Pacific Life, and I just want to th say that the one thing you didn't thank them for was the great wine servers last night. They were awesome. <laughs> um, it's been a really great third conference, um, and I just want to touch on a few random high points uh, from, from my perspective. We started out with the uh, session on marine mammals and fisheries. Um, and I think that was a really excellent session. I hope we have more great fishermen next time. Um, but it was really constructive, and I think one of the big take-homes was that we would all benefit from a lot more communication with the fishing community. Um, and there were some really good points in the discussion about how we have to sort of glory in the shining examples and give the fishermen who do a good job pat them back. And Jake came up with a, an amusing quote, I'd rather share an Ono with art, with art in Art's back, backyard than burn across in his front yard. <laughs> um, and I, I think we all feel that way, but I think that there's just not enough face-to-face -face time, and so it would be great if we had more face-to-face -face time, and I think that was sort of a general take-home from that, was that we do need to improve communication and seek some way of doing that, some other venue for doing that. Um, another thing that came out of that that kept cropping up on both days really was this notion of sustainability and how can we promote it and how can we define it and I, I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. Um, yesterday concluded with um, two workshops, one on uh, photographs and what they can do for you and the other on acoustics and what it can do for you. And to me, that seemed like sort of a new experiment um, in the type of venue that we've had at these meetings, where it was, it was almost sort of an internal training session. And I think it'll be really important for the workshop, or for the, the uh, folks putting this effort together to get some good feedback on that. Because I think it was a, I mean, from my perspective, it was a hard audience. You know, you had some people who had a lot of expertise and some people that didn't have any expertise. And so it was, it was, you know, it had to sort of hit the middle and I'm not sure how well, whether that was a home run or not. And so I think it'll be really important to get feedback. The, the talks were all excellent. There's no doubt about that. But the question is, was it the best use of everybody's time? So I think it would be uh, good to get some really good feedback on that. Day two, climate change. Something that's been coming up in these meetings, I think, from the very beginning was people are concerned, as they were concerned about the uh, threats presented to marine mammals from fisheries, about what's going to happen with climate change. And this is, is an example, I think, of reaching out rather than sort of reaching in, sort of instead of internal training. We got a lot of training from people who a lot of us see on a regular basis, but we don't ever get that knowledge transferred to us and vice versa. Um, so I think that was a, a really, at least I learned a lot, I thought it was a really great session. Um, and one of my, my favorite quotes from that session was uh, Mark saying, changing public opinion is completely beyond me. <laughs> so, I, and I think that's a, a generally a true statement for all of us, that's, that's not our forte. Um, and, you know, and yet, you know, we need to communicate our science to, to be effective. So, one of the things I took away from this uh, climate change was that we are moving into the realm of the unknown. And we all recognize that we're going to move into that realm without 
enough information and with a tremendous amount of uncertainty. And we have to come to grips with how to do that in a strategic manner. And, and I think the take home from that was that we need to, you know, sort of capitalize on putting all of our skill sets together. And there was the, the three-legged stool of, of saying that we need to emphasize that we need these uh, long, the value of these long-term uh, time series uh, to be able to really understand the systems. But we also need to uh, have some process cruises to elucidate what the mechanisms are, and we need the modeling to help us understand them and integrate all those things. And, and I think that that takes a lot of skill sets all put together, and, and so it, it speaks to, yet again, more, more collaboration. And then at the end of that session, um, we also came out with the idea of a uh, grocery store uh, app for sustainability. Um, and I think actually, you know, in terms of something that this group could look forward to doing, I mean, to me, there's a lot of work in just even defining what sustainability is. Um, you know, we learned in this session about, you know, how these systems are variable and we've got all of these uh, different species that are sort of marching to their own drum and going up and down. And, and then on top of that, we have, you know, incidental kill. You know, so you may be fishing a particular stock sustainably, but killing vaquita. Is that sustainable or not? And so I think defining sustainability very carefully and then working and reaching out to other parties that weren't in the room this time. But, you know, I think if we want to work on sustainability, we not only have to communicate with the fishermen, but we also need to reach out to the distributors, to the restaurant folks, and we have to decide how international we're going to be. And, but I think it's a real contribution that that could be something that this group could work on in the future. Um, let me see. We had a couple of great um, keynote talks, and I'm just not going to have time to go over them because I know you all want to go home. So I'll just say, Francis, that was the most wonderful quote. I just swallowed a sea lion, but you don't get pregnant that way. <laughs> so there you go. That's almost as good as blood smelling like perfume. So those vets are just priceless for quotes, I have to say. Um, the other thing that I, I thought would be something for the group to generally think about when you're filling out your uh, papers, which I assume is our next task before you're released from the room, is are we neglecting pinnipeds? I mean, it's really, there really were very, there's very few talks on pinnipeds. There's very few posters on pinnipeds. They are easy to study, much easier to study than cetaceans. And they give us a very different uh, way of looking at the world. And I think that they're, they're complementary things that we can learn from both systems. And maybe we need to reach, reach out a bit more because there aren't very many pinniped biologists that come to these meetings. So that's another thing to be thinking about. And then the final thing that we got to today was data integration. Um, and I think the main take homes there was that we, we really need to work on uh, data availability um, and find some way to, to make that work. And it's a keystone to all of these other things of, of, of being able to collaborate better. Um, so, you know, I think that we have some pretty neat tools, but we have to be able to sacrifice to, to be able to make data available and, and present high quality data, data that's available to the public. And on that I'll, closing note, I will say that for whatever reason, guys think databases are sexy and women say, what? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll leave it there. <laughs>